Sarah, it is so great to have you on this podcast. Um, I heard that you ran a track and field. So of course I did a Google search on you and you are basically like an all-star athlete, distance running, water sports, climbing. It's insane. What's probably like your favorite? Oh, you're going to have to go a favorite in the moment, you know, because there's sports are amazing. I mean, they're just, I feel like they're a part of my being and, you know, something happened and, you know, you always have that fear of like, what if it got taken away from me? What if I got paralyzed or what if, and I'm just like, no, I'd find another sport, you know, I'd take up whitewater kayaking or I'd find something, you know? <laughs> so I feel like safe in that, that you can switch gears. Uh, but I think climbing is probably, I mean, it's the most mental sport I've ever done. The most mentally challenging, the most facing fear, the most like, I am absolutely terrified and I have to literally talk myself off a little ledge, you know? <laughs> and so I feel like that carries over so much into real life when you're facing situations where they make you nervous, they make you uncomfortable. You know, you've got to put yourself out there and you're like, okay, I can do this. I put myself out there in this sports situation, which I'm not going to lie, pole vaulting at pin relays in front of a stadium full of people is also very intimidating. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but I think the, the climbing one freaks me out. I'm not a height person. And even like watching like movies like Free Solo or something, I'm just like a puddle of sweat. Just oh my God. And if you are not a puddle of sweat, there's something wrong with you. You do not understand <laughs> yeah. the impact of what he's doing. Because I remember my husband and I watched that movie together and we're both, we're holding hands and then we kept like letting go and like wiping our leg with our hand and like real <laughs> yeah exactly like I feel like I had to like change shirts like, after the wedding palm <laughs> so I worked at Northeastern University uh, for quite some time and you know especially as a collegiate level athlete I feel like we go through the same things I think I had a few experiences where coaches kind of made me lose the love of a sport and oh, when yeah. I was reading up on your track and field experience you set a line that like very much so resonated with me. And you said, uh, it feels like coaches want to break you, not make you better. And well, they have a limited time with you, right? They're going to get yeah. everything they can out of your body. And I, it's, you know, to find a coach that actually really cares about sustainability of your health. I mean, I was in the training room the whole time I competed at Clemson, you know? Yeah, so exactly. I, I and I just, I just put it to like the analogy of like a lot of coaches I've had experiences with, like dealt with you like magnets and they just threw you on like a fridge and were like, who's going to stick and make it through like this season. And who's going to drop out because the overtraining level is yes. real. And then you look at, you know, your, your past your sports, you look at, you compare yourself to what professional athletes are doing, which I consider those the people that made it through collegiate level with more resilience than somebody like me had. <laughs> you know, where I just was so broken down that this is not a good process for me. But you look at the professional athletes and they're the ones whose bodies can withstand the overtraining yep. and you cannot, I mean, they're, they're just, it's unhealthy workouts for most, you know, 99% of people. Yes. The answer, if something wasn't working was always the word more, that's it. And you think about it in the CrossFit arena too. You've got your essentially professional CrossFit athletes. And then you've got your, you know, normal people at the gym trying to compete at the same level or do the same workouts. And, you know, it's just across the board. I think it can be hard for us to compare. Yeah, I, uh, I have this analogy with like CrossFit as the same as football, the sport of football. It's like you have your pro level United States League. Then you have your Canadian League where it's like, yeah, you're not so good, but you think like you can train just as hard and whatnot. And then you have like your flag football rec league and the certain skills like flag football doesn't need to know how to tackle. Like that skill doesn't apply to that sport, mm -hmm. but yet it's almost like rec league football where they're learning how to tackle kind of a thing. And, and it's like this mismatch of like levels and intensity and especially these high level athletes, they're just freaks. So it's kind of different for them. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, 
probably really overwhelmed you when I initially asked you to be on this podcast because I just like brain dumped. I, I listened to a ton of podcasts you were on and I just like brain dumped you in an email and I basically asked you to give like a weekend seminar. You did. You, did. you were like, will you just teach this course for this podcast? <laughs> And it was pure selfish. I was like, how much can I get out of her in like 35 minutes? I just want to know everything. But Uh, we're going to try to break this down. And do our best. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So we have very like practical application here. Um, I love theory, but I really want to kind of get into the, the details a little bit. So who are typically the individuals who come to work with you? And what are some of the issues that they're dealing with? Um, so typically I seem to attract a type people. I know that might not be relevant, but it just seems to be just a little bit more drawn to me. So you're going to have a more higher intensity level, generally exercise personality, um, go getter type person. And then I have had a very mildly robust orthopedic career, um, with working with back pain and hip pain and shoulder pain and neck pain, and then switching into women's health after I had my first child, uh, because I had issues that I couldn't get easily resolved, um, with local public care PT. So I felt like, okay, I needed to dive in and learn more, um, because the standard of treatment wasn't, wasn't fixing me. And, but I knew there was a fix. I was like, this is, I don't, I'm not a settling type person. Um, just a personality type, I guess. And, you know, it's, so I dove in and learned as much as I could. And I felt like that, you know, was about a decade ago and almost, and it was, it was a little bit new in the world, like bringing together the ortho aspect into pelvic floor PT back then, um, was new and, and interesting. And now there's so many integrated things. Like it's just normal. You know, it's normal to talk about 360 breathing. It's normal to talk about hip function and the pelvic floor, but back then it was not. And mm-hmm. so it's been really cool seeing the transition within women's health to more of a joining of ortho and women's health. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. That is. So I, I know that's like your kind of niche or the most uh, most people who come to work with you, but are there any like males and specific issues related to that who come to work with you? I've seen a lot of males with piriformis pain, labral okay. tears, uh, diastasis, um, hernias, things like that. Okay, fair enough. All right, so now I want to kind of dive into decision making. So, mm-hmm. can you just take me through um, what do you think about an assessment um, and how that leads into considerations for treatment and you know exercises you might give someone? Absolutely. So this was kind of a big, overwhelming question. (laughs) If you say like, okay, tell me about somebody who comes in to see you to help with leaking. Like that is going to be basically the same process, same assessment process. I'm going to take somebody through who comes in to see me for back pain or knee pain, you know, to some degree. And so taking, you know, looking at like an individual issue is not as important. I think is looking at the kind of how we should look at people. I feel kind of strongly about that. And I feel like sometimes uh, things are missed and then that's why people fall through the cracks or they don't get better is because we look at the issue, not the person. We're like, oh, I know how to treat knee pain or I know how to treat, you know, this is X, Y, Z or the exercises I give for somebody who has piriformis pain or whatever, when you think about the PT world like that. Um, So I feel like we fall into our patterns, so to speak. And Mm -hmm. so instead of really looking at the person move, um, we end up, with just, here's what I give for this, you know? Um, and, and it's a little bit of the fault of the system because you just get overwhelmed. You know, I mean, if you're a PT and you're treating, you know, eight hours of patients a day and you have to do paperwork on top of that. And I mean, it's just, it it can be crazy because sometimes they'll schedule in back to back, like 30 minute patients or two patients at once. And it's just like, how do you work in the system? Okay. That's a side note. Well, let's dive into this assessment. <laughs> anyway, what I'm trying to say is that I think it's more the fault of the profession than the person. So with saying that, I don't want to say that people, it's not something that purposely happens, I feel like, because I feel like you don't become a PT because you don't care and you don't want to help people and you don't want to do your best. So yeah, we, I we all do sure the that, that yeah, awesome. we all do the best we can until we know yeah. better. And and sometimes logistics, um, if yes. even for a client, right, they don't have a certain type of equipment, you're not going to just, you know, throw your hands up in the air. You got to work with what they have. And it's working full time and they have four kids and, 
they're, they're now taking care of an aging parent. I mean, you're just yeah. what you're going to be, what they're going to be able to take on. It's, it's, it's going to be this huge feat for like getting in two exercises every three days versus, you know, somebody who has a lot more time. Yeah. Fair um, enough. Okay. So, um, us looking at assessment. So the first thing that I love to do is watch the person walk in. So I love to see them waiting in the waiting room, so to speak. All right. So are they stiff? Are they guarded? How do they get up from the chair in the waiting area? Because as soon as they know you're looking at them, it's all out the window. They're, they're trying hard. They're moving different. So getting that like sneaky look at somebody, I mean, even on like, look out the window, like, how did they get out of the car? How did they walk across the parking lot? If I'm able to do that. Um, I think that can be really fun. How do they bend over to pick up their purse from the floor when you're like, Hey, come on back. And so that's what I really want to see. Cause that's going to be completely different than what they show me in the assessment. All right. So for me, that's really the important place of where the assessment starts is when they don't know it's an assessment at all. If I can, I try to walk behind them in the hall, you know, like, okay, yeah, we're going to head down there last door on the right. And then I'm going to watch how they walk when they don't know I'm looking at them. Like, do they swing their arms? Do they hold their arms really still? Do they drop a hip? Like does this, their shirt wrinkle on one side of their back? So that goes ahead and gives you clues of how their body is moving in space and how they're controlling that movement without thinking about it, which I feel like is so important. Uh, And then I really like the subjective part of the exam. So just sitting down and talking to them. Um, what makes this just you feel worse? What makes it feel better? When did it start? You know, how does it come and go? Like, do they leak only when they have heavy squatting or is it something that happens on long walks or is it something when they project? Like I've had a lot of professors that leak when they're teaching in front of a class because projection can be very difficult for pressure management. And so like, when does it happen? Because that's going to already tell me so much about what's going on is when their issue is happening. Um, and so I feel like that part of it's really important. And then, so you take those kind of two steps right there, and then I'm going to formulate my idea of, okay, what are their goals? What are their issues? What do they look like coming in? And then that's going to direct me on what actual test I want to do. And that's going to really vary wildly, not by issue necessarily, but by the person in front of me and the level they are at and kind of what they're presenting with and then what their goals are. So I might do some tests like Ober's test or Thomas test. Uh, Ober's is the adduction drop test for PRI people. Um, You know, I might palpate muscles. How do they feel? What is in range feel like? Is there stiffness? Are there trigger points? How much guarding is happening? All right. So does the person really need some manual work before exercise will be accessible to them? Because sometimes we just have to face it. Like a range of motion in a joint is just not where it needs to be. And it's, Sometimes you need a little bit of manual therapy to move that forward. I'm not a huge manual per- manual therapy person as far as like continued manual therapy, but I think a lot of times at the very beginning of something, manual therapy can be extremely effective for getting really, really fast results if you can combine it with the right approach and right exercises. And, all right. So I really think that a moving assessment is going to help you spy more compensations. And this is where I feel like there's so much overlap between training and PT. And this is where I feel like there's all that gray area. Like, is it rehab or is it training or is it just both? So anybody can watch somebody do a squat. Anybody can see the compensations in the squat with practice, you know? So I like to assess that. What does their breathing look like? So this is going to tell you a whole lot about what's happening with their pressure management system and their, their thorax and abdominal pressure with how their breathing looks, um, So depending on the person, I might have them squat to a chair or I might have them do a single leg squat. You know, if I'm assessing a runner for leaking versus somebody who's like, I haven't worked out in 10 years and I'm a professor that leaks when I project to a room, I'm not going to have them do a single leg squat. That's not going to tell me anything for the level that they're at right there that I need to know. Like, obviously the single leg squat is probably going to look terrible. So (laughs) when I assess that, (laughs) you know, Um, so it's not so much that my assessment is based on the issue is it's based on the person. So when you look at, when you asked me for an example of a specific thing, I was like, I, I can't do that. I need to know more about the person. Like what, where is this person for this issue? Um, so let's see um, what else. So I like to pick an active movement that fits their complaints. So are they having trouble deadlifting? I want to see their hip hinge. Um, are they at the level where they pick up all the toys after their kids are playing and they have back pain after that? I still want to see their hip hinge. So, you know, one's loaded, one's not, but we're still going to see how they bend over repeatedly over time, you know, looking for those obvious things like hip shifts and pressure management and 
how their abdominal wall is firing. Um, and then what's their pain point that they come in with? So like the leaking, the hip pain, the back pain. Uh, and it's not always something I'm going to work directly on. All right. So fix so many things where you find the movement strategy issue to clean up and then it fixes the issue. So in some ways it's like, yes, we want to focus on the issue, but then in a lot of other ways, we really don't want to focus on the issue at all. And I feel like Shirley Sarman was really the groundbreaking physical therapist for this, where she has a great textbook called movement impairment syndromes, which came out after I was in PT school. So I didn't get it in PT school, but I know a lot of people have that graduated after me, um, but absolutely amazing textbook. But I really feel like she was one of those founding PTs for let's just look at how people move instead of focusing on where their pain is. You know, we did this with like patella tracking. So you remember people used to have patella dislocations and they're like, let's strengthen the VMO. I learned to strengthen the VMO when I was in school. Oh, so many things to <laughs> have, a, have a good springboard for and then move forward on. <laughs> so, yeah. So I looked at, you know, patella, something simple like patella tracking, where when I was in school, it was all VMO focused. How do you strengthen the VMO? You know, and then, you know, a, MRI looking at a squat with somebody who had lateral patella tracking goes, Oh, wait a minute. It's femur movement. It's not patella movement. So it's lateral hip rotators. It's your glute strength that's causing your patella to, which is like, Oh, that totally makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. why would we try to think about a quad muscle that's running in this sagittal plane controlling lateral patella tracking. It doesn't make any sense when you actually really think about it to that effect. But sometimes we need the research to be like, aha, <laughs> we figured it out. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, when we look at, you know, if somebody comes in with knee pain, you should look at their hip and their ankle. So all I'm saying is that looking at how they move is so important. Um, looking at what they do with their abs. So are they an upper ab gripper? How's their abdominal balance? How does their pressure management look? You know, if I've got somebody who leaky, who leaks, I really want to know like, what happens when they have that really forceful exhale, because especially with postpartum women, they end up with a lot of lower abdominal weakness. And so what happens is, is their upper abdominals don't get as weak. So those upper external obliques, especially become very overly dominant. And so when they project their voice or think about lifting heavy, which is also a very forceful exhale, they're not gathering their abdominal wall pressure equally. So what ends up happening is they end up putting pressure down on their pelvic floor and their pelvic floor can't control that amount of pressure. And then they leak a little. And so it ends up just becoming a pressure management game at that point where it's like, is there really something wrong or can we just figure out how to balance this pressure a little bit better? And do they just need a little bit of lower ab strengthening and down-regulating upper abs? And then all of a sudden they quit leaking and we really only did a little bit and we didn't actually do a ton of strengthening. We just down-regulated upper abs a little and stopped upper ab gripping and brought a little awareness to their system. So sometimes things- can I think be that's- Fixes. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a big paradigm shift of down regulating, because again, going back to that more and more, every answer is kind of a strengthening, you know, question of like, hey, what can we strengthen? And it's you're saying, hey, what can we kind of bring down a little bit? Yeah, exactly. I see a lot of people where, well, like I said, I deal with oftentimes I attract more of that A type, you know, intense person. Mm -hmm. And so I bring a lot of intensity to everything. <laughs> So a lot of people are like, whoa, 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 let's just back this off a little bit and kind of even things out. And then all of a sudden, we're like, yeah, hey, it works now because it's it's more a little bit balanced in the system, um, which can I find to be especially hard with the higher level athlete you get because they've really done a lot of repetitive motion, typically because it's a sport, it's a repetitive motion generally. And so they've built up a lot of strength in some areas and other areas get a little bit neglected. And so then that deficit can become so much larger versus somebody who has not spent a career exercising. Fair enough. You know, a lot of the stuff, you know, I definitely didn't think of this of F view, but a lot of uh, people's assessments have to are solely related on biomechanics. And a lot of the things that you're talking about, you're watching the person kind of behave um, type A personalities, you're, you're really getting them to kind of reconnect to their bodies a little bit. And I think that's a big factor in the whole client experience, even how you talk to your clients, it seems like you're considering like the whole picture and not just the biomechanics related towards everything. 
Yeah. And I love biomechanics and my courses are very biomechanics and mm-hmm. But I think at the end of the day, if you don't have the biosocial component, you're not going to get the results you want. But, you know, likewise, I don't think everything's biosocial. <laughs> so yes, yes. I do think there are very specific things that we can look at and change, which if you're fully in the biosocial model, you don't really believe that. You just believe everything <laughs> is you know, magical and you can help the person believe and it all works. But, you know, I think that, that when we bring both of them together really well, like a highly trained biomechanical person that knows specifics to look for, and you can get really, really fast results. Um, but if you're a biomechanical person and you scare somebody, and then they have come in with that side joint pain and then they never move or bend over again, even though you know the right things to give them, you get them in such a fear state that they can't overcome it. They're not going to get any better. So that kind of hard, you know, hard line biomechanics also doesn't work. So. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, yeah. So, so with that assessment, I mean, you look at something like a squat and if they're falling through the middle portion of their squat and then kind of catching themselves having to really hinge way forward, things like that, you know, they probably don't have internal rotation because you've got to mm-hmm. access internal rotation to get down through the squat. And so there's little things like that, where you just watch somebody move and you've already got so many clues as to what's going on with their body. Can they hinge and disassociate the sacrum from the pelvis? You know, can they get sacral nutation? <laughs> and a lot of these moms that I see that have a lot of tailbone pain and p- posterior pelvic floor tightness, they can't unstick their sacrum. So that the whole system is just coming forward. And then it's like, oh, well, no wonder you're having pain. You know, no wonder your SI is bugging you or your piriformis or your low back. You're not, you know, things aren't getting as much movement as they need. Um, and what are some things that you help like to, I, I kind of give the analogy once people are pushed forward, we'll do a lot of exercises that kind of push them back. Yeah. If they need to be pushed back, then absolutely. And helping to kind of unstick that area, which I really like eccentrics a lot. Um, I feel like eccentrics help us unwind. They help us let go. They help give us space. They help give us, you know, length. And so I think eccentrics can be really good in more of that rehab setting where you're helping things open. Cause I feel like in life we do a lot of concentric and we don't do that nice, slow unwinding. Um, so let's, what what would be like a specific exercise for that eccentric component that you like? Yeah. So maybe let's say, let's take somebody kind of high level. Um, let's say a runner who has a little bit of maybe their sacrum's kind of trending over to the right and they've got some right sided posterior tightness. Um, Mm. they've got a little bit of leaking because of it, because as soon as that hip gets shoved forward in the socket, as deep hip rotators are super tight, um, it's going to affect the alignment and the ability of the pelvic floor to contract. And so maybe they're having that issue kind of all together. I might do something like a single leg where they stand on the right leg. So hip hinge and then have them pull down. So kind of eccentrically pull down and have them sh- do some hip shifts where they're coming up and down, where they're kind of sucking up on the left and then pulling down on the right. So they're opening that back area. So it's almost like you would take like an iliacus pullback um, from the PRI, like that adductor sideline pullback, but then you yep. do it in standing with a little bit of hamstring drag, maybe on the like floor or the wall. And then that can create that shifting through the pelvis. And then sometimes that can really open and unlock that area. Maybe even have them hold and do some big inhales into that area, Mm. you know, and then you can take that and then use it after like have them. um, So once you get it open, then you can have them maybe do a single leg squat or like a split squat, but where their back leg is close. So it's mostly a single leg squat, like have them shift most of their weight in their front leg and then have them hold ipsilateral to help drive more of that internal rotation. Um, and then help them kind of own that new opening that they're getting. Yes. Yes. That's a great yeah. example. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> okay. We're getting into some specifics. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of like that, you know, you can even do things like a cat cow. That's a really good lower level exercise. And you can see maybe where their spine isn't moving so well, check for that stiffness. You know I mean? If they can't extend their thoracic spine or they can't flex their lumbar spine, you know, that that's going to be a big, big issue for them if they can't get any flexion in their lumbar spine and they're stuck in lumbar extension. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a toe touch is a, is a great way to do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Toe touch is a great way to do that. Um, if somebody has got guarding though, if they've got back pain, then a toe touch, like for my, for what I do in the PT world, like sometimes yeah. the toe touch can be 
um, kind of hard. And if somebody's guarded when they walk in, I'm going to be really careful with the things they feel a threat response. So if they have pain bending forward, you know, I might be a little bit careful in that first session to maybe kind of look at all things around that, but in more of a training area, then that would be awesome to yes. yeah, pull that in. If, if someone's coming in and, you know, they're, they're scared about bending over, they're probably seeing you first before they come to come to see. Yeah, you. yeah, exactly. So I kind of like to look at it as quality of movement perspective versus a diagnostic issue. Like, so I'm going to watch a move. I'm going to see what I can clean up. And then I'm going to go from there. And what does that give me? You know, what results did that produce? And I just feel like that's a nice way to kind of take a patient more on a traveling a path versus like, I'm going to give you this and this is going to fix you. It's like, no, we're going to peel back this layer and then we're going to see what you have left. And what I get is a lot of times I'll see women for pelvic floor issues and they'll be like, oh, my knee pain went away when I was hiking. I didn't even know that was going to happen. And I'm like, well, it's the, we're approaching this more from a, just a watching you move and improving the quality of your motion. So then it's going to help, you know, the things that are down the list. Like I, I have this, I wrote a blog article unless so you might've read it, but I had this one man who I was seeing him for a labral tear and hip pain. And so we worked on his hip pain and that was fine. We fixed that. And then we um, could not get rid of his diastasis. And it was so frustrating for me because I worked on his breathing. I worked on his rib cage. I did all this stuff. I was like, why is this not working? And finally I was like, let me watch you walk again for like the fifth time. And, and when I saw him walk for that last time, I mean, we'd worked on arm swing. We'd literally worked on like, you name it. <laughs> and I was at the end of my you know rope for figuring things out. And I was watching him walk specifically looking at his feet and he was almost throwing himself forward. So he could not, he did not have the, arch strength to initiate a calf raise or a push off from his foot. And so he was going straight into his calves. So it's almost like when you think about that person dropping a squat, it was like the same thing. It was like, he was almost kind of pushing, but falling forward a little bit because he didn't have the foot strength. And so that was putting an excessive stress forward on his abdominal wall because Mm. he was almost kind of throwing himself a little bit with his gait, if you can imagine that. And so I got him doing calf raises. He could not do one calf raise, like standing in front of a wall, like he could not literally could not lift himself up on both feet. And so I even had to give him like a little counter to push off of. And then he worked on his calf strength and it helped fix his diastasis, which blows my mind for when you think about, Oh, take me through a treatment process. If someone has diastasis, I'll be like, I can't, I mean, I can, (laughs) but you know, sure. I'm going to give you this handful of exercises and it's going to fix 50% of people. But then that other 50% that did not get any results from that handful of exercises, where do we need to go from there? You know, do we throw in the towel or do we want to keep digging deeper? And he was such a good perspective of me, for me, of digging deeper and really, really continuing to look at somebody and then finally getting results. And I just think that it was so cool. It was such a turning point for me. <laughs> That's amazing. What's the uh, article for people so I can show it, uh, throw it in the show notes? Do you remember the title? I can find it. Yeah, it might be a tale of two diastasis or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll find I can look it. Up right what, <laughs> so what are some of like the specific exercises you gave him? And did you give him anything to like put in his shoe that kind of like? No, I just gave him calf raises, focusing okay. on the bottom third of the calf raise. Not the top because he had he was fine slinging himself up, yeah, but yeah. the bottom third of the calf raise just initiating off the floor and lifting a half an inch to one inch, feeling his arch and coming back down. Cause he had been, he's like, Oh, I I do calf raises. And I was like, well, let me see how you do them. (laughs) So that's, I think a lot of times I feel like, Oh, I do that. Like, well, let me see it. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And, And that's where like the detail and intent comes in because we all, associate certain exercises with an, uh, an outcome. But if, if you're not doing it to the level of detail or a different cue, you can give someone like you could be using you know, a different muscle group or a different result can come out of that. So the fact that you can kind of tweak some, something very small, like a calf raise and make a big difference is, is crazy. You've got to have the right person to be able to handle that. I'm not always the right personality mix <laughs> with that intensity. You know, you've got to have somebody who mm-hmm. can 
is in the right frame of mind for, for being you that way. And that's something I've learned. I think the hard way over the years is figuring out who I can give a lot to and who I need to kind of take a step back and meet them where they're at. Like their life is not in a place where they can handle. I mean, it just, it's, it's me being a mom. I've gone through phases where, you know, I might get instructions for something and it's like open packaging, you know, soak with water, put an oven, preheat. I'm like, oh, it's too hard. It's too much. It's too many stuff. <laughs> You know, so I think we all go through those phases in life where, you know, having three steps for something is too much. You just yeah, need- and we're also not good at taking care of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. We, we'll take care of you know a, a pet or someone in our family way before we'll take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's so true, especially with moms too, because that's a, that demand is crying at you. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, so we'll definitely come back to that. But so specifically for you know fitness or strength conditioning coaches, I kind of want to just shift just a little bit because I know you're talking a lot about squatting. How can trainers look at something in the gym and kind of connect it to the pelvic floor? For example, I think it's really, really great. You gave a lot of examples of the squat. Um, cause that's what I use in my assessment. I call my assessment, the first session, my orientation session. So mm-hmm. I don't look at anything really in isolation unless there's a specific problem or I'm getting like a referral from someone else. I really look at these global movements and try to make a lot of connections to does this person have internal rotation, external rotation? What's the shape of their pelvis? How are they moving? Um, And even things that you talked about, you know, if someone who I have, I'm going to say, Hey, we're going to do some hopping. And then they say, Oh, let me go to the bathroom first, you know, cause they're Mm -hmm. leaking, you know, early in my career, I wouldn't make that connection, but now I feel like I can kind of point out things a little bit better. So can you maybe talk about that? Like in terms of like the weight room, what can you kind of use as proxies towards maybe what is happening in terms of pressure, pressure management in the pelvic floor? Yes. Again, yeah. another overwhelming I mean, question. Well, it's, it's just so hard to know who has a pelvic floor issue. Yeah. Because they, they just volunteering that information is is quite tough. But it's it's you know it might be the people that are uncomfortable jumping, um you know things like that where they they do run to the bathroom that could give you a clue to open the door for the conversation. So you know you want to find out is this something you're just worried about or is this something that's actually happening you know completely normalize it for the person in the sense of like let's have a comfortable conversation you know and and really i think even being a a man a male trainer you can make that conversation comfortable because there are a lot of male obese and women see male obese like having a man talk to you about your body is not the most awkward thing in the world if the person talking to you is comfortable mm-hmm. And I think that is the biggest kind of key right there is you've got to come across as really comfortable and present it in a way is like, Hey, this is normal. And this is actually something we can work on. So that's why I wanted to just bring it up and see is like, is this just a habit, you know, or did you not, have you not peed in like three hours and you're like, Oh, I better go pee before I jump. Like, you know, yeah, that's valid. You go pee, <laughs> you know, yes. but I think that, you know, opening that door to that conversation and then. Maybe it's something really easy to clean up with their jump roping. You watch them jump rope. Maybe they come down and land in a posterior pelvic tilt, you know, that's putting even more force on their pelvic floor. Um, So is that something like that creating the issue or do they have maybe a core strength deficit? Do they have arch strength problems? Like what I talked about, do they have glute strength? Do they have calf strength? Like where's the rest of their system for supporting their pelvic floor? So they might not have a pelvic floor issue at all. They just may be putting excessive force on their pelvic floor because of their landing, because they don't have a support system strong enough to jump like that eccentric control that we're talking about. So sometimes if you can create like glute eccentric length and maybe some calf and arch strength to help absorption forces, then the problem might go away, you know? So it's like, is the pelvic floor just being asked to do too much? I mean, did they have a baby? Did they have maybe some levator ani tearing, like, is this an issue that maybe they are not going to ever be able to fully show up for, for strength. And so it's kind of one of those things where, okay, we've got to face that now. Now, what is everything we can possibly do to help make up for that strength? Like, how can we kind of ease things on the pelvic floor a little bit, you know? So there's definitely 
things for looking at it that way is, is not always the fault of the public floor. That's, that's really helpful. It kind of goes back to you talking about like everything's one big puzzle, right? And not, not just solely <laughs> focusing on one thing. <laughs> oh, that's great. So um, you are kind of known for being associated with the Pasteur Restoration Institute. Is that kind of fair? Or is that just kind of like a school of thought that you've been exposed to? It is a school of thought that I love. Yes. So I am happy to be associated. That's a compliment. Um, I don't know if I do it justice. Um, <laughs> like I was saying earlier, I'm still a little lost on the cranial course I took. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't think I have a full, full ga- a grasp of the PRI in that sense of like, you know, being an expert PRI person, but I absolutely love the concepts that I've taken away. Um, I think that that has always that that's taking away concepts, bigger concepts. Like I said, Shirley Sarman changed the way I practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, a genius. Um, Gary Gray with his functional movement stuff. Awesome. Uh, you know, Gary Ward, all of his foot stuff. Like I think there's, there's tremendous, tremendously smart people <laughs> that are in our industry that are all bringing amazing systems and school of thoughts. And I don't think I'll ever be a system or school of thought person. Like that's just not how I, how I work per se, but I love to be able to take, you know, this from this person and this from this and, and be able to kind of, okay, now how can I make this work for the person in front of me? And it's been fun to come up with new exercises and things like that, because I have had to invent something for the person in front of me because I can't get anything to work. And I'm like, but I see where their body needs to move. Okay. How can I make it move like this? You know? So, but coming up with this, you know, the big stuff is like the PRI stuff is, is really great. Yeah. Tim and I have done a few podcasts, basically like giving our our gratitude towards how that school of thought and the courses have really kind of changed some of the things that we uh, think and um, expose us to a new type of information or, um, just like different ideas on how to like view things. And so just, you don't have to say like anything in regards to the posture restoration too, but what are maybe some things that you really changed your mind on in the past couple of years, uh, since you've been exposed to, I know how much information you consume and experience yeah. and knowledge you have. So I think what's interesting is I don't think there was really, I think, <sighs> You know, I spent a lot of time in the Stu McGill world back when I was treating back pain and ortho, heavy ortho. And I think that the only thing that really, really changed my mind as far as that goes was so much lumbar flexion and finding room for that much lumbar flexion. Like I was never the school of thought that like, oh, don't ever flex your lumbar spine. Like I never went that far because I feel like the body needs to move in all different directions. And I've done enough sports where lumbar flexion is a thing for the sport, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the body needs to move in that direction. But I think the degree to which the repetitive nature to which they take lumbar flexion, um, it's probably something that really hit home for me for helping me make a bigger shift in that direction okay. um, from Stu McGill, who was like, you know, the non-flexion person. Um, and, uh, so I think that would, that would be probably the main thing. I, I was already working internal rotation before I ever took a PT class, just a PRI class, just trying to get rid of people's piriformis pain. You mm-hmm. know, like I've had a runner pause and press their foot against the wall while squeezing something between their knees to like create that internal rotation leverage to immediately release their piriformis. And then I'd have them go run a quarter of a mile and then come back like on an indoor track. Like just what can I do to help this person elicit some internal rotation and adduction into their movement to help their deep approach to gripping that's going on. And then the PRI gave me more precision within that world that I was already working. So I was like, oh, this is a great internal rotation exercise. So it kind of built that more of that repertoire of what I was already trying to do in a way. Um, My teacher in school, like, I learned 360 breathing in school. That's just pulmonary. Like, that's how you breathe. <laughs> it's not like this whole world of like belly breathing and then the 360 breathing. I was like, well, but I already learned 360 breathing. That's just how the rib cage moves. You know, we've got joints in the front and joints in the back. Our rib cage moves up, you know, in this bucket handle fashion. Like that's, that's just normal breathing. So I think that depending on kind of where you went to PC school and what was taught and what you remember, like some of that is they hit home in a more emphasized way 
but a lot of that's just normal and has been around for um, a long time, but their exercises are very precise, which yes. I really like. Very detailed. Yeah. Um, switching gears just a little bit. So you have a really, really big social media presence. Um, how do you balance that with your life? Because obviously, in my view, if you have that large of a social media presence, it's kind of, it can be pretty consuming in my perspective. So, you know, how do you balance that? Yeah. So I actually got more offended with, you know, negative comments and things like that in the very beginning when I had a thousand followers than now, um, which I know is so interesting, but it's like, now I'm just like, I can't take anything personal because this isn't, it's not personal for people, yeah. you know, they feel like they can say anything and I'm just this robot on social media, not a real person with real feelings. So yeah, I guess. <laughs> but one of the things that I was trying to start this online business because my husband had moved me again, <laughs> again. and we, we moved again and I was trying to start an online business because I was like, I am so tired of starting in-person businesses from scratch. And I, so I was sitting there, you know, working by myself all day, trying to be productive. Kid was in daycare. And it's really hard when you open social media, if you look at social media. And so one of the roles that I started for myself when I started my very, very first online is I do not scroll ever. So I do not see things posted on social media. Um, and so if if somebody's post happens, you know, like I open it and a post happens to come up and I'm like, oh, that's my friend. Oh, I like that post. I like it. But I feel like I missed out a lot on some of the traction because I don't go around commenting and liking people's posts and interacting because I just, I don't have the bandwidth and the time to interact on social media. And that rule took out so much of the comparison you know, Mm -hmm. and that I think was a real saving grace for me because I treated it like work instead of pleasure. Cause a lot of people look at social media for pleasure. Like it's a nice little outlet and they, you know, and so my eyes need breaks from screens. So I read paper books and, you know, I just, (laughs) I just, I can't. Fascinating. (laughs) I just need a break from a screen. Um, I have friends, I text them. (laughs) <laughs> I that's them. crazy. I that's know. crazy. It, it, it's, it's a fascinating ordeal. Um, you know, picking up the phone and calling someone, but just having moved so much and been disconnected from my friend network, it was so hard for me. Cause you know, you move to a new area and you don't have any friends. And so I spent a lot of time just calling a friend because I needed that connection. I did not need social media. It was not, that was not a healthy way to feel connected to people. Um Cause then you fall into comparison and you see what people are doing. And it's just, I don't know. Was a, well, that, I think yeah. there's a, people place a lot of emotional energy into social media and confuse it with reality in some, in some circumstances, because, you know, they're scrolling or they get unfriended or followed by someone and they view that as a connection or self-worth. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people, get kind of overwhelmed and be changed by their social media presence. And that's something that really kind of scares me at the end of the day. Well, um, when, when you don't know who's following you because you, you're not <laughs> in social media as checking your social, yeah. as your social, then, then you, then you don't care yeah. <laughs> because you don't know. But <laughs> when you get like those negative comments, do you ignore them or do you respond? Um, it depends. If it is a comment that is inappropriate, then I will just simply delete it and just decide that person, you know, that they're having a bad day. Like yeah. that was not an appropriate comment. And if they were sitting in the same room as me, they would have never said that. Like they just, they weren't thinking and maybe it's coming across wrong. So I, I, all my friends know that I hate it when people take things wrong. I know that's a silly thing to say, but I don't have, like, I have trouble being around sensitive people because I'll often just say the wrong thing. Like, I'm just, you know, I say what comes into my brain and it comes out. And sometimes it doesn't always come out worded the right way or the way my heart means it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's very important with being an emotionally intelligent person to be able to take a step back and say, how might that person have meant it in the best possible way? Because I know that person and that person is friendly and lovely and they would never say something purposely mean. And so I just generally try to assume that online. Like, okay, if I change the tone that's in my head, 
to something that's maybe just a more direct person who has a nice tone because I'm direct, you know, I can get that. And then all of a sudden you can read it from a completely different lens of what is this as a friend in the room? And what if they're not attacking me? What if they're not being accusatory? Maybe what if they're really just curious about this? Or what if they really just like, I am becoming a stumbling block for their beliefs and I'm making them question something. And that is uncomfortable for them because they always thought X, Y, Z. They always thought, oh, you do external rotation with this, or you always turn your feet out in a squat, whatever. And I am confronting their values or their belief system that they have built upon for their professional career. And they haven't been to a place yet where they enjoy questioning those beliefs. Like I love questioning it, like bring something on, you know, that's why I took my first PR class. Cause I was like, you know what, let's bring this on. I want to see what this is all about. So I love looking for courses that are going to question how I think or how I believe. And, you know, if you're just not ready for that, then you see something online and it can be that knee jerk reaction. So one of the things I like to tell people is there's no wrong answer. And that's what I say in my teaching a lot in my course is there's not a wrong answer. You are not going to get this wrong because whatever you think, whatever you do is going to be right for someone somewhere at some time. And I think for us, that's so important for us to internalize. So even if somebody corrects me on something, you know, I have found it the most frustrating thing for me is a post is only so long. I can only get out so much information. So when somebody's like, well, you got this wrong and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I get that. Sure. There is this instance where I would definitely do that. And no, I, yes, I forgot to mention it, you know, and sometimes that irks me a little bit because then it makes me feel dumb because it's like, just because I forgot to mention that, then somebody thinks that I don't, I wasn't thinking about that. And in reality, it's like, I got 2,200 characters where you have to sum up everything you know, because people are going to judge you on that one post as the entire existence of your intelligence. <laughs> so sometimes that acts me a little bit, but I would say that's probably the only thing that makes me a little bit, but then that's just my pride, right? Yeah, that's just yeah. my ego. And I think that's what climbing has given me is you've got, when you're climbing, you've really just got to put your ego aside and you've got to focus on finding joy in the process and the learning and the appreciation uh, for the rock and for the movement, not your ego and whether or not you climb the stupid thing. Like if you do that, you're just going to hate climbing and it's going to be frustrating, awful experience. So I try to look at social media the same way, like, okay, let me put my ego on a shelf. And if I can step past myself and know that I'm not always right, because I'm definitely not always right. What could I learn from this? How can I improve? How can I be better? And how can I be more kind to people in the future? Because I know how this feels. You know, and you're never going to have somebody come to your social media account and lay into you about what you don't know who is worth anything because we all know how it feels, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's another important thing to keep in mind. (laughs) Fair enough. And so, you know, you didn't just kind of get a huge online presence overnight, what are kind of some of the steps or some of the things you had to learn to grow your online business? Yeah. So it's been a really long process and I'm thankful that some evolution has happened because in the beginning I had to have more of like a persona, like more, more confrontation than I actually am more like, you know, always doing Kegels is awful for your pelvic floor. You know, or here's why you five reasons why you should stop doing Kegels. Like you've got to have a little bit in the beginning. I feel like to get traction, you've got to have those like polarizing. Oh, oh, let me check this out. I need to see that be be a little bit more polarizing so that people who kind of think the same way you do to some degree find you. And then I've had a lot of people who are like, wow, you're too polarizing. But then they actually start to get to know me a little bit and like, oh, you're not polarizing at all. It was just a voice that I found created the most traction on social media and so what now I feel like I'm to the place where I can be like, oh, yeah, whatever. It'll, it'll, <laughs> it's all going to work. Like everything is right, you know? <laughs> yeah. And one thing's not defining one you. Kind of thing, but try to get traction from ground zero being like, oh, everything's right. And, you know, it's, it's that's, <laughs> that's kind of how I am. I, I consider myself a, a moderate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, not good. Nobody votes for moderates. <laughs> <laughs> point taken but moderates are what we need moderates are usually who's right you know (laughs) (laughs) all right I'll I'll take that one (laughs) fair enough um so what was what was we always ask this question at the end what was your last workout that you did 
Oh, I went to the climbing gym yesterday and mm. I, I climbed and it was lovely and fun and I enjoyed it. <laughs> so that, was not exciting, but. that was fantastic. That was easy, huh? Yeah. But exercise is great. Um, you know, and when you can add a lot of variety and add a sport, a natural sport in there. So that's my passion is helping women feel confident going to the climbing gym or going to play pickup basketball or going to join this rec league for whatever they want to do, you know, after they feel like, I don't want to say some women feel like your life is ended after kids, but honestly, I've been in that place. It's so hard. Um, Fair enough. And we, we talked about things being polarizing and I feel like my kind of world strength missioning can scare people a little bit because it's like, they have these expectations of, oh, we are just going to lift heavy things where it's like, you know, I kind of oh, mentioned God. your oh, yeah, all around skills. It's like, no, we can do a lot of stuff and be good at a lot of things in different movements. And we don't just have to kind of be polarized towards, you know, Olympic lifting or power lifting or and things like that. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine somebody walking into a power lifting gym or facility or a CrossFit gym for the first time and has never done it? Or even for that matter, like a yoga studio. I mean, I know people who are too embarrassed to even go try yoga, but they kind of wanted to, but they were too scared. And yeah. you're like, no, these are loving people. You should go. They're going to talk all about your heart center. You know, you'll be fine. But <laughs> it's just, it's so hard for us to step outside our comfort zone, right? Yeah. The hardest thing is to start, yeah. right? Um, mm-hmm. But so we talked about your social media presence. So where can people find out more about you? So my website is coreexercisesolutions.com and I have a ton of free articles um, and free videos. I've got a whole six part series for professionals. I'm um, just you're starting to look at breathing, diastasis, pelvic floor. So if you have any interest in uh, that area for women or men, because I feel like it carries over to just warm bodies. Uh, I think that that's a good freebie to grab because it's got a lot of information in it. And then uh, if you just Google my name, Sarah Duvall, it'll pop up for social media stuff. <laughs> yes. You have a, you have a good uh, Google search follow up. That was how I started. When you talk about starting this online business. I yeah. started not the Instagram was not a thing when I started online, which I think is almost um, a blessing. Cause I feel like the Instagram world could be really intimidating and hard. And so there was no Instagram. And so I just worked on SEO. So I wrote a bunch of articles and got Google traffic as how I started my online platform. Not I mean, Instagram didn't exist. So <laughs> I'm so thankful I didn't grow up with like a cell phone and social media. I, I, I just consider it an absolute blessing. Yeah, well, I do too. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with my children yet, but yes, it's uh, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. Uh, thanks for having me.